If you look at the adoption of EV battery technology in the different locations around the world, mm. Gendermark India is certainly leading the role. They've had a very almost exponential growth in the space. It took us six to seven years. Obviously fast track because we had the experts coming from South Africa into Gendermark India. You are 100% right. And he was so curious and he was like, I have to come to India. It was very important for me to come here and see it and experience it firsthand. When I see it in Germany running and you go into the plant, I can't tell you this one's from India, this is from South Africa. When I go to your shop floor, I have, it's the same feeling for me. It was very nice and I was very surprised from a German view what you do here. We're in the right place to drive our global EV strategy out of India. Technology has enabled us to get from A to B differently. The East team came up with a solution. I was intrigued, but I thought it was going to be a completely academic exercise. Four weeks later, they called a meeting. I walked into the room and immediately I knew they had succeeded because the smiles in their faces, it lit up the entire room. It sounded so crazy using AI. All customers have a problem that needs to, that needs to be solved. Yeah. The art in which you try to understand the problem is the differentiator. So welcome gentlemen and uh, nice to have you all in India. I think for the first time we have got all three of you. Akim of course for the first time in India itself. But I think it's quite rare to see both these guys who are actually trotting all over the globe at the same time under the same roof. The audience will definitely like what you guys are now going to speak because it's never common to have both of you on the same couch. Yes. So let me start by uh, asking Quinton uh, and maybe all three of you the same question you can answer uh, in sequence. How has it been for you to be in India in the last four or five days? Well, okay, maybe I'll start. It's been absolutely astonishing to see the growth of EV I even, I mean, I was here, I, I come quite regularly to see the development in, in the, uh, the space, um, the uptake in two-wheeler, three-wheeler market. Uh, and most astonishing for me is to see how Gendermark has responded, Gendermark India has responded to this challenge uh, and this opportunity. Absolutely amazing. Oh, yeah, one, I think uh, just for uh, benefit of the audience, Quinton is being quite humble when he says these things. Uh, for he, I, I remember distinctively the conversation me and Quinton had when he was in Germany last month at the battery show and he was behaving like a child who doesn't know something and he was so curious and he was like, I have to come to India to understand everything and anything about EV that you guys are doing. And, I, and first we thought of an online session to explain but I, I just felt that it won't do justice. If you don't touch and feel stuff. It won't do justice. You are 100% right. I don't think you could ever convey that in, yeah. in, in a virtual meeting. Uh, and it was very important for me to come here and see it and experience it firsthand. It's, it's been fantastic. I've obviously um, been fortunate to observe Gendermark India's journey into the EV space. Um, and I think I'd, I'd, I'd highlight two points. And, and I think this, this trip has um, solidified my thinking in, in, on these two points. The first one is <clears throat> Gendermark India is certainly leading the role in the group's strategy for EV. Yeah. And the intention of the trip was to expand the, the strategy, to expand what we do here in India to the rest of the world, which is why we asked Akim to join. That's the first thing. And I think the second thing is, if you look at the adoption of EV battery technology in the different locations around the world, mm -hmm. obviously the, the hotspots are Europe and China. They've had a very almost exponential growth in the space. But if I look at India in the last four to five years, that growth is beyond exponential. Yeah. So if I look ahead at the same growth rate into 10 years, who will be the leader? Right? It's a simple logic, logic to follow, right? Answer. So China has been the leader. They've been growing. Europe is in some respects catching up or in some cases the same as. But India still got some space to go. But look at the growth rate and I think you'll know the answer. So, so I'm extremely excited. I feel fortunate that we're in the right place to drive our global EV strategy out of India. It, it just has solidified it this week. I, I think um, the IP for most of the time has been from South Africa yeah. through to India. 
And what I'm really pleased about is now we're seeing a return of IP and understanding uh, to build a better future together. Which brings us to a third guest, Akim. Ah, it's not so easy to explain. So, um, no, we had a lot of discussions about this before. So I'm, I'm dealing in Germany, mostly with German, or in European, mostly with German customers. And uh, so the market is changing. It was always combustion engine or uh, Germany was always number one. And now there are a lot of players from all around the world, from China. The big, big guys are delivering electric cars and the German market is a little bit crazy. So also when I visit our customers and there is new technology, I'm not allowed to go in. That's, a, that's also why maybe the EV business is new for me. When we had discussions here, Janusz, Quinten, whoever, Himanshu, about EV, what's going on, what's going on. And now we decided that we come all to India here for the workshops. The first two days, it was in my eyes very good. I learned a lot of things. So I make a lot of, I make a big step for myself to see what's going on because it was not a, it was not a complete secret, but it was new. When you are an engineer, you know, you can work on it, or you make next steps, but it's taking time. But um, in my eyes, I learned here a lot. It was very good, also from your team. And when we go to the shop floor, there's the first machine, or we visit some, some, um, customers. some customers. It was very nice. And I was very surprised from a, a German view what you do here, because I expected it not on this level. That's what I, what I can see. Did you expect, when you landed in okay. India, Sorry. how Gendermark India would be? In my eyes, uh, when I see a machine, when I go here to the shop floor and I compare it with South Africa or whatever, when I compare our South African machines and when I see it in Germany running and you go into the plant, you don't know that this machine is from South Africa or this one is from Germany. And when you are now in India, when I'm now in India here and I go to your shop floor, I have it's the same feeling for me. I can't, I can't tell you this one's from India, this is from South Africa. Yeah, I think that it looks like for me it's on the same level. I think that's uh, with due credit the efforts which both teams have taken from South Africa and India because to reach that level, uh, I think it took 20, 30 years in South Africa to be at a level where Europe couldn't make out a difference. And for us, it was obviously fast track because we had the experts coming from South Africa into Gendermark India. It took us six to seven years. Yeah. But I think I'm, I'm quite proud with the efforts both teams have taken to yeah. bring both countries geographically so far apart to a point where we can send equipment, solutions, assembly lines from here to you and you can't make the difference then. So I think that's that's a good step for both sides where we have reached right now. You know, we all know there's no guidebook. We, we all three have been traveling, meeting so many customers and maybe Anish, you can also chip in on that. How do we decide? Because everyone is from my team keeps asking the same question and I don't have an answer. So I would like to ask that question to you. How do you decide which customer should be engaged in which way? No, because every time we have a discussion with a customer, we all three, we, we change our thought process and we try to adapt to make the customer understand better or we understand the customer's perception better. But we always change our thought process and we don't go with a fixed mindset. So, so how do you decide, both of you? So for me, uh, a big driving factor is, is this customer just going to be a customer? Or is this person or entity can be a long-term partner with Gendermark? Um, customers may come and go, yeah. okay? But partners and relationships, they're the ones that withstand the test of time. Um, and they're during a, a journey, you always hope that there's no problems. But it's working with people that when things happen in a project that you can work with. Um, so that's what I look for specifically is long-term partnerships and people that we can grow with. Well, because I'm amazed to see the ease with which you have been able to engage even with the Indian customers who are not okay. normally whom you engage with. I'm, I'm sure you, you travel mostly to US, Europe and so you're, there's a culture which is there in most of those continents mm -hmm. which is more or less similar. Okay. Right? But when you now swing yourself into India and last few days I've seen you engage with so many Indian suppliers, partners, customers, general public as well, but your adaptability to engage them and we, I'll come to that question as well, to engage them and they're all looking at you as if you have seen the guru now. So how did you... I, 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 he is I, I, the guru. I he is, he is the guru. I, I, I don't think it's that. I think there's a, a universal truth about doing things with the right intent. Yeah. Okay. 
And if you go out there with that, I don't think it's as much as me changing my uh, approach to the customer. I think they respond to that is your intent. People understand or maybe feel that they can participate, they can grow with you. Uh, and that a, a, a partnership is, is something important, it's valuable, it's something to be cherished. Um, if you treat people like customers, uh, they will just remain that. And that's, for me, not a good way of doing business. So I think it's just a natural response to people responding to an intent. I think that I would disagree that I think every country, every company, every company that is operating in different locations has different cultures. There's, I think, selling in Germany is not the same as selling in India, Definitely northern not. US, yeah. certainly different in South Africa. Absolutely. But I think the universal truth is that all customers have a problem that they would need solved. Well, some create problems, but mostly. Okay. You said it, not me. <laughs> but all customers have a problem that needs to, that needs to be solved. Yeah. And I think the the art in which you try to understand the problem is the differentiator. Okay. Some 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 for some people, and it, I think it comes down to the personality in the room, not necessarily the country. Yeah. It's you have to play a passive Absolutely. role and listen. Mm. Some customers you need to play a more active role and put solutions on the table. And then they'll pick the solutions. And I think it's really, at the end of the day, trying to understand the problem the customer has, not throw solutions. So yes. the moment the customer feels they, that you genuinely understand the problem that they have, they will relate to you. And then you, you can have the conversation. I'd say that to be the first point. The second point is, in a B2B environment like us, we, we, we sell to businesses. Our business sells to another business. So there's a there's a business need on our side and, and, and the company side. That's pretty clear. I need a production line, so many volume, this is the process, the B2B need is kind of solved. But underneath that, there's a human need. Mm -hmm. So the uh, 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 production planning manager that comes and talks to us has a personal goal. It The project becomes personal for them. So it's also understanding not only the business need, but that person's intent, their goal, with trying to make their internal project a success. Because if they deliver the project record time, under budget, they're heroes in their organization. So if we can enable not only the B2B requirements, but also the individual requirements and make them a hero by trusting, by, by you know, understanding what's the two types of problems, yeah. it, it's, the, it's, the, it's the sort of key to it all. So, so, so in the simpler words, was. Many times I am. I think it is easier for us, maybe because we have a position, but it's not the position. It's understanding the person in front of us, which comes to or which should come to anyone without a position. It's because a lot of times there is a discussion. Oh, it's easy for you guys because you guys are the the top guys, and you can always talk to the customer the way you feel that. But I think, and that's what even my answer has been is, it's not the position that you hold. It's when you sit in front of a customer and look at the customer and try to understand what is his problem and what is it, what is it that he is looking for. Quinton, you started in 1989 to now this era of Industry 4.0. And we both have been debating and discussing of how, if I can say, the strategy specialist yes. is trying or are trying, has convinced us to look at business of the software side in a different way. Can you take us through the initial steps of when this was thought of? <laughs> because so, I'm struggling with it still in my head since... No, it's, yeah. it's been a struggle. So uh, he always gets mad at me. I, I call myself a rack and pinions guy. Yeah. Okay. Um, because I'm a mechanical engineer, I'm passionate about it. And this is, we have a, a particular way of doing things. Um, and I really got turned around where I had some dreams of being able to put out into the marketplace what was considered a crazy idea, this assembly line that could be uh, doing different automotive components, for example. And I'm going to use this as an example. Um, 
he and his team came up with a solution which complete, it sounded so crazy using AI, okay, in my mechanical world uh, <laughs> to accomplish what I wanted. Um, I was intrigued, but I thought it was going to be a completely academic exercise uh, that they're going to try it, they're going to fail, and that's it. Four weeks later, they called a meeting. I came back from a trip from the USA, and I thought, ah, capitulation, this, this is over. Uh, I walked into the room, and immediately I knew that they had succeeded, because the smiles on their faces, were it, it lit up the entire room. They proceeded to show me how, with AI, we could do positioning systems, which today they call Phantom, a product in the Odin range. And um, then proceeded to show me the, this system, and I could see my dream of what I had was actually small. I wanted to do, in the automotive industry, uh, an assembly line that could do particular parts, a corner module, one shift, a turbocharger the next shift, and maybe a water pump the next shift. What they gave me at the end of the day was, I could do a medical device on an assembly line on one shift, one from the electronics industry, the next shift, and the other shift I could do something from the automotive environment. And That's that was an, an, an ignition point for me, okay? And uh, I've learned now today is to how to look at an assembly line, change my thought process of how we would do a discussion with the customer, develop maybe a process uh, in within our consultancy. Doesn't it shake your fundamentals of last week? Completely. Complete. It shook every single pillar that I had, that I thought I was firmly rooted in, and had something to work with. And I had to evolve. Well, not evolve. I really had to change. It's not a rebirth. It, it, it really it is a rebirthing process. And so today, I mean, I'm looking at assembly lines. Wasn't that simple? It, 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 it was not simple. <laughs> uh, it, and I, I have to apologize a lot to him for this futile struggle I had against him of not adopting sooner. Okay. So, so Anish, for the benefit of the audience, give us your thoughts on what is Odin all about? In simplest way, whether maybe although he's on the 50 plus and still in this world of Odin, we're all six-year-olds compared to you. So if you can explain us how and what is Odin. I still feel like a three-year-old mm. learning to talk. <clears throat> so I think maybe let me use a, my favorite analogy in the transport segment. Mm -hmm. So if we just cast your mind back 10 years and I said that you could get to work every day and back, whenever you wanted, how, in a different car every day, with pressing a button on your phone, would you believe it's possible? You wouldn't have. Yet today, ride sharing is everywhere. In Germany, you can pick up a car, you can go on, on an app, I forget the name of it. Blah, blah. Is it blah, blah? No, no, so you can, you can, you can see where you are, yeah. you can see a car, order the car, walk to the car, open the car with your phone, oh, wow. get in the car, drive it to wherever you want, leave it there, and, and go to your meeting. So, the, so, so, so technology has enabled us to get from A to B differently. And I think what people forget and mis, misinterpret the fourth industrial revolution, industry 4.0, Odin, if you want, as um, a... As, as a an outcome it isn't an outcome getting from a to b has always been the requirement i just now get from a to b differently so the solutions that we have on factories on on, on the shop floor today are not different outcomes we still need to make battery packs yeah. we still need to make cars and seats and fridges maybe the product changes but we still need to make those things how has technology allowed us to make those things more effectively like you can get from A to B. It's the technology is a different tool in your toolbox for you to produce your product better. It is not the end game. Like AI is not the end game. It's a tool that you use in a product or a solution to produce a battery pack more effectively or to make a line more flexible. Flexibility. 
as an example of what, what Quinton was talking about. So I think there's a, a misconception that technology is the end game. It's not. Production, output, efficiency, That's operator the end game. is the end game. Yeah. But how do we use the tools in our technology toolbox to improve the outcome? Um, make it cheaper, better, faster. And Odin is basically a series of apps we've created using advanced technologies that enable our customers to produce their product better. It's, a, it's really as simple as that. And I, I've been one that's fallen into the trap of being too technology focused. And you make a technology AR for the sake of AR without understanding the value to the customer. And you get down this rabbit hole and you're like, but why is people, why are people not buying my AR? And look how amazing it is. Because we haven't truly understood the problem. So I've changed my mind completely now and I focus on really trying to deep dive in understanding what is the customer's problem first and what are the tools that I have that enable me to solve the customer's problem more effectively. Because these tools are gonna change. Customer's problem doesn't change. So, so would it be fair enough to say, and I'll come to Akhim in a bit for that, Industry 4.0 and Odin are not necessarily the same things. It is not that Odin is our offering to the world under the Industry 4.0. It's it's a part of it or some sections are part of Industry 4.0. Some are just our ways of solving customers problems which we have been let's say understanding over the last three decades. Yeah. So it's taken us 30 years to understand the understand problems. The problems yes. so and so that's our biggest advantage. Mm -hmm. The fact that we have AI specialists and computer vision specialists and cloud specialists is, is a, an advantage. But the biggest advantage is understanding the problem. Yeah. And, and, and ultimately, Odin will evolve. It is what it is today. Check the website, videos, et cetera, et cetera. Work instructions for operators. That was born out of South Africa coming out of apartheid mm. and operators not being able to read. Yeah. Yet they had many variants of engines to produce. So you had to put pictures. And we couldn't print pictures, too many enough pictures in the station. Not enough space. So we put a, a, a screen there. Yeah. And then we started to animate the screen. So we understood the problem and then that's how Odin evolved, right? Yeah, I think I can, I can take the same uh, reference to what has happened in India is the language. We are solving a big uh, language issue in India where there are hundreds of languages and there are people who understand. In the same state, we have people who understand one language but not the other. And now what we have been able to solve with Odin Workstation is give the instructions visually with some bold comments in the local language. So there's an immediate relation formed when I go into my workplace and I see a language which I relate to, I talk to every day in and out, I understand it. Was uh, like you said, we have had workplaces before which are filled with A3 printouts, small pictures, even smaller text and the operator who doesn't understand that language is supposed to read remember and perform yeah and whereas what we now see is a big transition where it's like we say it's, it's more human centric what is the value proposition odin offers or can offer or is already offering in germany or in europe in general where the problem statements which let's say south africa or africa in general and asia has are different compared to what you experience in europe no, I think Odin has a full package. That's maybe the main thing. Odin has everything together. Maybe other companies have something of this, a piece of this, a piece of this, or maybe nothing. What we, what Odin has, so the the Odin scope in total is much bigger and much higher, in my eyes. So, so are the European customers uh, warming up to Odin as such, or is it you feel Odin is not for Europe or not for US? I think it is for Europe and also for US. In my eyes, it's, in, in my eyes personally, it's a, it's a good help for the operator. Also, not only for the operator, when you have the work instructions, whatever, the manager can see in real lifetime what's going on. Is it, is it working, yes or no? If you have a problem, that's maybe the, the highest priority for the guys when they want to run the line. They must not wait till it's broken. They know exactly, okay, I have maybe eight, nine, 10 days, then I have a big problem, so I fix it now, yeah. or I can plan it. So, so, so think about it. So the, the the environment in Germany and in, in the US is very different, obviously. It's much higher volume, uh, but the biggest challenge that they have is high variation. So in the past, they would make 
two, three variants of a diff, and they'd run batches. But now they can't do that. You have to have batch size one, and you have to be able to adapt the number of variants because of mass customization on the line. So how do you do that cost effectively? You can't stop the line for one week and add a variant. How do you add variants on the fly? So their problem set is different. In India and South Africa, it's very manual, so you can be a lot more flexible. But the other thing is, as well, in, in the United States specifically, they have another skills issue where yeah. operators are a huge turnover. Uh, turnover of operators. And our, the systems, the technologies now are able to train those operators quicker, uh, get them up to the speed, their ramp up speeds on the production lines are far quicker due to the technologies yeah. that we deploy. Let, let me, let me so, sorry, cut you off there. Couldn't. Let me ask you this question. As a CEO of a machine building company, and let's assume Odin adds value to your end customer, right? Um, how much effort would you have to put in if you were to make Odin over and over and over on all of the 40 lines you've delivered with Odin? So imagine it wasn't a product and you had to do those yeah. same outcomes. I think it would be unbelievable to, to imagine that if we didn't have Odin as a product offering, as a, as a product, to keep on doing every time the same thing to ensure that the end result for our customer's product is correct. I think I, I can't even put a number on it because honestly, you, we have now got so used to in our thinking, well, Odin solves this problem. Odin Engage will solve this problem. Mm. Odin Checkpoint will solve that problem. Yeah. So I think it's it's a way of thinking that we have now already embedded in our systems that the moment we see something which needs to be fixed, we have, okay, we can fix this because of these products which we have. Yeah. Otherwise, if you have to do it, let's say from scratch every single time, I think it would take a lot of time and effort for every one of us. Maybe you would have to have four or five times the number of people you have got exactly. and still not be sure. And so what Odin has done is, as a machine builder, brought massive efficiency in, yeah, yeah. in you delivering your product. And, and for our customers, yeah. because they are far more secure and safe. Yeah. The, the, the analogy that came to mind is, not in my day, but maybe in your day. <laughs> okay, yeah, let's hear it. Big production lines used to run on relays. Yes. Yeah. Oh, good so man. you'd walk, I remember walking in Salskita. Click, 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 click. In Salskita, there was an engine line, I don't know how old it was, and you walk past it, all you hear is click, 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 these relays controlling the whole production line. And that evolved to a PLC. I think what Odin is, is that next evolution. Yeah. So PLCs made machine building much easier, much more effective. Now we don't even appreciate it because we didn't, none of us grew up with developing lines with relays. So in the future, I hope that Odin becomes that. What the PLC is to the production line today compared to the relays is what I think Odin will be in, in the, the future. future. Yeah, is that efficiency I, for machine builders and the customer? Because really, the, inf the, the problems that even MESs are trying to solve is what is happening on the production line. It's understanding how metal is being formed, shaped, joined together, how people are interfacing with the production, where are the problems. And all of that information, as it were, whether it be a laser sensor or a part-in-place sensor, a simple part-in-place sensor, resides in that PLC or with Odin to be able to extract and offer up to uh, uh, an ERP system yeah. uh, for I, the I, financial controllers to understand. I think, probably controversial, I think companies today buying MES systems for discrete manufacturing production lines, yeah, it's wasting money. Wasting money. Wasting a huge amount of money because and I, they, I they actually don't understand it. Engage with customers and they're like, oh, we have got this MES and it is storing all yeah. the data. And I ask them, okay, can you show me that data? They don't even know where to go. And if they are able to bring somebody to show that data doesn't make sense. It's and, and they'll never be able to adopt AI. Yeah. I think, I think we, we will go through the different steps. The adoption and digitalization, automation of, of data is, in, we're in that phase at the moment. AI is coming very quickly. And you, if you haven't got these first few steps right, you, you, you will not be able to seize the opportunity with AI. Yeah, no. And if you are not as a manufacturer, my opinion is if you do not adopt AI and machine learning on your shop floor, you will be losing out. You will 100% be left yeah. behind because your competitor will be much more quicker, better, faster. Than but you. I think, so I 100% I, I agree with what you're saying is what, what I'm seeing in many cases now, maybe it's in same in South Africa or US or Germany, is this 
FOMO, it's the fear of missing out on having something which is actually making people do anything. Yeah. And then they end up in a mess and then there is a general perception Oh, we tried digitalization, we tried digital transformation. Yeah. Uh, this industry 4.0 is all crap, it doesn't work for us. Yeah, it's a hype cycle, right? It, yeah. So, so, so you have the hype, then it drops to the value of destination, yeah. uh, but and then it comes out. The right? initial consultation part, I think which, yeah. that's where we, and I've seen uh, us talking and explaining customers. We have one of the few guys who say, who tell the customer, you don't need this. Yeah. And whereas what I'm seeing, because there is this fear of missing out on industry 4.0, uh, there are people who are just going to catch hold of somebody to do something and then industry 4.0 or the software solutions earn a bad name. Yeah. It's not the solution that is the problem, it's where it is deployed, it is not supposed to solve the problem. Yeah, they don't understand the problem. Yeah, I think, uh, but that's maybe the problem with industry 4.0 in my eyes. How long is this topic now? 11 years. 11, 11 years. years. At the beginning, everybody was collecting data yeah. and they don't know what, but they collect everything. Everything. Since yeah. they had such a big amount of data, they only collect it because they don't know what they really need. Yeah. Nobody, they say, uh, I don't know what I need in two years. Maybe I need this in two years. Maybe I need this. I have no idea. That was the start. Yeah, and okay. now we, are, we made a lot of progress. So Quinton, I have always, uh, since the time, last few years, I've always thought of you, or I, if I look at Genomark as a big boat from the olden days, or let's say from the Pirates of Caribbeans, you're that guy who stands on the top pole with this telescope, looking and telling us as a, Guys in the board below, what's going to happen in the future? Yanis is the guy who's probably steering the ship. Secret is holding the. Not listening to Quinton. Not listening to me. <laughs> 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 I hope so. I hope that's not the case, but yeah. Well, uh, Graham is the guy in the engine line, engine room below. Yes, yeah, sure. he's, he's, he's peddling. He's like, listen, just tell me what, what should I do? Right? <laughs> and, and Sig is the guy who's actually building at the harbor. When you bring the stuff here, I'll get the goods. Yeah. So, so that's my analogy when I think of all four of you. Okay, Quinton's up there looking through a telescope. Yanish is the guy who's the captain who's steering the ship. Graham in the engine room below, sweating and making dirty and himself. And Siegfried waiting at the harbor there, waiting for goods to be delivered. So that's something which I always thought of. But uh, yeah, I, Siegfried would hate me for this, but <laughs> he does play an active role as well. Where do you see us going forward? So, uh, like I said, I'm trying to make this transition, transition from what a mechanical analog person to this digital. So it's just ones and zeros right now. Um, so for us, the business has changed dramatically in the, the basically the fledgling company Odin of the Odin products being removed from the gender mark full. It's getting out of the nest. Uh, gender mark automation growing in more into the United States and the European business using um, a springboard of India as a strong manufacturing partner here with you guys in India uh, to be able to do more in different sectors. Um, what we've experienced as well is with a range of products and our expertise. And we define ourselves as auto, an automation company in the automotive space. But what we're seeing is that the technologies and the knowledge base that we've had takes us into many more industries uh, very comfortably uh, where we had not been previously. Hydrogen, um, we're looking at um, things like storage of hydrogen, hydrogen plants, fuel cell applications, um, and medical. even to medical devices. Medical medical devices. devices. So it's, it's been, uh, there's, there's one that Yanesh is terrified of is nuclear medicine. We've had uh, people come to us from the nuclear medicine um, uh, marketplace um, asking for our expertise, not only in the mechanical engineering, but also in our industry 4.0 portfolio to be able to assist them. You see these little red dots here, <laughs> <laughs> nuclear medicine. So <laughs> it, I, I see a very bright future for Gendermark expanding into much, much more than just the uh, expanding in the automotive industry, but to other sectors too. Yanish, having seen Gendamark since a long time now, where do you see Gendamark going forward? And maybe more specifically on the Odin side, what are your thoughts on how, where do you see Odin going forward? Yeah, so I think that um, we've proved over the last couple of years that the software solutions we pro we've been developing and providing our customers adds real value. Um, 
and we've we've delivered those solutions and it's had a significant impact to our customers operations <clears throat> so as a result of that what we've decided to do is actually separate odin product out into a new business um, that business will operate uh, independently it will obviously uh, allow odin to sp spread its wings um, beyond so you're ready to let your child go out now yes that's the the tough part, right? Mm -hmm. you, you nurture, you nurture, you nurture. At some point, you have to let it go. So we believe that the time is now. So we're in the, in the throes of uh, setting all of that up. Uh, and the launch will basically be um, in the next couple of months by opening up Odin uh, USA. Uh, so we'll be se setting up a, a Odin USA and uh, setting up a sales team, um, deployment team, and uh, uh, First step would be to expand in the US as a purely software company with a set of integration partners. Uh, and then we'll start to roll out the same concept in India, South Africa, and uh, in, in Germany. So you, you all could hear it out. Odin is now going to be a separate entity in the Jandamag family. And uh, that's, that's, I think, uh, exciting news for all of us here to finally see a transition of a manufacturing technology solution provider to a software company. So, yeah, yeah uh, to be honest with you, I, 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 in theory, it, it is a software company. Yeah. But but I think at the heart of it, we're a manufacturing solutions provider. Right. Right. Exactly. Yes, the tool and the mechanism is software, but I don't want to take off my safety shoes. No. I want to stay on the shop floor. I want to make sure that I understand our customers' real problems. And if software at this point in time is the right step to solve the problem, then we do that. For a German guy, completely clear is for a South African completely new. That's also in India. Maybe, I don't know what, is the German guy right? Is the Indian guy right? Is South Africa, who, who makes the right decision? I don't know. But from my eyes, from a technical view, it's, uh, we are there. But what we must, we must go over the bridge now with the cultural things. Yes, I think that's, uh, that's uh, you have touched a very important topic, which is, which is something which even I experienced having previously worked in a German company is, uh, I think technically, Notes to note, books to books, we understand. It is the non-technical aspect, if I can say the emotional aspect or the understanding of the person's mindset. Yeah. Uh, that's somewhere I think where uh, there's a gap. Uh, and I think with, with you uh, being now the bridge to ex exchange emotions. <laughs> well, I, I give you an example. I'm now here for seven years. I started 2017, January. And I always make this failure. It's not a joke. Well, when I'm under pressure, I make this failure. When I get, when I'm under pressure, I get an email from a customer, whatever. There's a big problem. I send an email to a colleague in South Africa, India, wherever. I say hello. I need this, 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 this. So then I get an answer, and I say hello, Achim. How are you? Are you okay? And I say, oh. we are being, we are being very polite. I'm feeling very terrible because normally I, do, I ask this question before, but in Germany that's not normal. Yeah. In Germany, maybe one of one hundred ask you how are you, but normally they say hello, Himanshu. I want coffee, I want whatever, tea, do it. No, and I, then it's done. So what is right? I don't know. Maybe your, your way is much more friendly than the German way. But that's what I can tell you. But um, yeah, that's, uh, I don't want to, um, to be bad to the people. I, only, I, only, I need something. So it's, I don't want to be unfriendly or whatever. And I'm feeling not so nice after that's happening. I think, I think it comes down to understanding each other's culture. Yeah. So when Achim sends an email without, how are you? It doesn't mean he's being unfriendly. So we also need to understand that. Yeah. I'll, I'll, and when I send an email to Achim, how are you? I actually don't really care. 
Yeah, I know. That's the other thing. You know, so yeah. I'm, I'm asking, how are you? Because it's, it's, it's what you do. It's what you do but yeah. the truth is, do I really care? No. no. Uh, you maybe, so yes. Maybe I do, but... but um, you mentioned not. But that's, that's, it's just an understanding. I mean, in the US, if you uh, send an email and they reply, they won't say, hi, Anish. They'll just type. Yeah. And is that good or bad? It doesn't matter. It's just me understanding that when I receive an email from a US customer and they don't say, hi, Anish, how are you? They don't even say hi, Anish. They just start typing. Yeah. What the, the response? It, it's, it's more like you're chatting they, in WhatsApp. No, it's, it's it's yeah exactly. It's, it's just how it is. It's easier to manage and match because it's yeah. what is written. Yeah. You can see. Uh, you can what what you can't see is what you feel and experience. Yeah. And I think that's very important that we try and understand that aspect also. And uh, like I said, work yes, on I think for you, cultures. especially for India, to go directly to Germany would be difficult. Yeah. But when you go to Gendermark, Germany, with some German guys or German people there, it, it should be it's easier. It should be easier. Or, um, uh, I hope we will see a result in that. We will, I'm yeah. sure. I I I'll give you an, another example. I think in India, effort counts a lot than results. Yeah, no results count obviously, but, but I think effort needs to be appreciated. Yeah. In South Africa and in Germany, like if you if Achim works hard and doesn't get the result. I'm less appreciative of the effort. However, in India, you have to show appreciation, even if the result is not there. Thank you for the effort. Yeah. But I, I, I'm not like that. I'll ask, I, as you know, but you didn't get the order. Yeah. So what? You worked six months on it, 24 hours a day. You didn't get the order. I don't care. But you, the point is, you didn't get the order. Yeah. Whereas in India, you would deal with it. I appreciate the effort. You put in so much time and effort. You didn't get the order. It's okay. But I think, for example, those kinds of things. It's important for all the cultures and organizations uh, within Gendermark to understand each other's culture, to not be offended, to also not offend. And then it also puts you, uh, to makes you better prepared for interaction with cult customers from different cultures. Japanese culture is completely different. Yeah. Chinese culture, it's completely different. different. You've got experience working in China. It's not good or bad, right or wrong. It's, it's, it's different. Just just it's just, different. Let's say we should learn to respect each other's differences. Everything is not going to remain the same, no. cons constant everywhere. No. Good. Uh, which maybe brings me to the last segment of our conversation uh, is how do you feel, Akim, once again, of being here, but not just today, now, but when do you see or how do you see yourself coming to India again and what would you like to see in Jannamak? Any feedback personally for me as well? No, I'm very, uh, it's, I'm very positive. Uh, surprise, right? What was this? Yeah, surprise. I, I didn't expect it on a, such a high level. Also, when we had this workshop with EV, uh, it's really I learned a lot in this time. And, and I, like I can't say that I'm completely new in EV. That's the yeah, other thing. But sure. I'm, I really, I, I made a lot of a big benefit for me. What, what would you like to see next time when you're here? I hope that you have some big orders for EV. Maybe one big order for a German customer. Wonderful. That we are here with uh, some German guys to make, make a pre-acceptance. Well, that's know. a good vision to have. That would be a nice vision, but maybe not in three weeks. Yeah, <laughs> not in three weeks. <laughs> Any same question to you? Any feedback for Gendermark India in general for me as a friend? Uh, let that happen so I can play golf. <laughs> Wasn't that the KPI? Yeah, for that was a KPI ago? for seven years. I'm still fighting to get that. And I still can't play golf. Yeah. No matter how much I try. <laughs> um, <clears throat> Uh, I, I think it's a, it's a similar hope and vision to try and take the experience that you guys have gained out of Denmark, India, and share that with the rest of the world in some way or form. Slowly, step by step, um, to know what we can't do, accept that, bridge the gap, and keep moving forward. I think that's uh, what, what I hope to see. Um, just for you. I think that's your ethos. That's who Himanchu is. Um, when you first quoted the cell sorting line, Very you royally right. stuffed it up, right? Yes, absolutely. But that happens. If you're not failing, you're not trying hard enough. Yeah. Um, and so I think that failure is, is a result of the entrepreneurial spirit that you have, the, the, the need to always want more, to do more, sometimes too much, but that's how you learn. Um, and I'm absolutely confident that under your leadership, we'll achieve the goals that we, we all set out for ourselves. 
Thank you. And I think on behalf of everyone listening to this podcast, especially in Jannah Mark India, I think we are we are one hundred percent committed committed to make this vision a reality very soon. Yep. So thank you very much. Uh, I think it went longer than we thought, but uh, I think it was important to share what you feel and not just the work part, but even beyond the work part, what we feel about the company, the group, the solutions we are working on, the customers, good and bad ones. So thank you very much, yeah. Jens. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks for having us. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thanks.